in spite of all the rhetoric, we will go deeper in debt, the Fed will print more money, and the value of the dollar will continue to plummet. Ron Paul Never in history have the economic and political structures been so manipulated by those who are responsible for their safekeeping. Never has so much been at stake in so many countries and facing collapse all at the same time. The great majority of people in the first world recognize that the world is passing through an economic crisis. However, most are under the impression that there are some pretty smart fellows running the show, and all they need to do is tweak the system a bit more, and we'll return to happy days. Not so. The smart fellows who are in charge of fixing the problem, are in fact, the very same people who created it. Understandably, this is a hard concept for most people to even consider, let alone accept, as the very idea that those in charge of the system might consciously collapse it seems preposterous. So, we might wish to back up a bit here and present a very brief history of the system itself in order to understand that the eventual collapse of the economic system was baked in the cake from the very beginning. From the very earliest days of the formation of the American Republic, bankers, along with inside help from George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, sought to create a banking monopoly that would create the country's currency and become the central banking system. The first attempt at a central bank was a failure, and strong opponents, including Thomas Jefferson, prevented a second central bank for a time. Later, further attempts were made by bankers and their political cronies, and each central bank was either short-lived or defeated in its planning stages. Then, in 1913, the heads of the largest banks met clandestinely on Jekyll Island, Georgia, to make another try. Having recently lost yet another bid to create a central bank, due to the public's understandable concern that the big bankers were already too powerful, a new spin was placed on the idea. This time, they decided to present the idea as a government body that would be decentralized and would have the responsibility of restricting the power of the banks. However, the new bill was in fact the same old bill, with a new title and some minor changes in wording. But this time, it would be presented by the new president, who was a liberal. The president, Woodrow Wilson, had in fact been handpicked by the banks, the banks then scuttled their own Conservative Party's candidate, got the Democrat Wilson elected, then installed a Secretary of the Treasury, whose job it would be to ensure that the Federal Reserve was created. The bill was widely supported by the public, even though, in truth, it was not a federal agency, but a privately owned conglomerate, controlled by the banks. Neither was it a reserve. It was never intended to store money, it was intended to give the biggest bankers control of the economy. They followed the central principle of Uber banker Mayor Rothschild. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. From the start, the new institution peddled itself as the protector of the people's interests, but it was quite the opposite. Its purpose from its inception was to control the economy and the government by controlling the issuance of the currency. In addition, it was to be a system of taxation. Typically, a population accepts a certain amount of direct taxation, but has its limits of tolerance. Yet, the bankers understood that a less direct method of taxation was infinitely more profitable and infinitely safer from criticism. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you'd learn something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update and watch to the end to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. Inflation was not always the norm. At one time, prices were relatively static from one generation to the next. But the Federal Reserve touted the idea that controlled inflation was in fact necessary for a prosperous economy. Of course, the greater the debasement of the currency through inflation, the more the central bankers profited. But at some point, the currency would have lost virtually all its value, and it would be time for a reset. 
the currency would need to collapse and a new one created. And so, the Fed set about its 100-year program of continuous inflation. Although there have been periods of lower inflation and even deflation, the program stayed more or less on course, and now, its 100-year life has all but ended. The dollar has been devalued almost 100%. And so, we find ourselves at the day of reckoning. The economic crisis we are now facing, not only in the US, it will be felt, to a greater or lesser extent, worldwide, is not a mere anomaly that we need to push past. It's a systemic crisis. It's been created by design, and the system must collapse. Of course, the central banks are in the process of protecting their interests to make sure that, whilst this will be a major economic calamity, they themselves will continue to profit. The damage will be borne by the general public. This began in earnest in 1999, with a repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, allowing banks to create a massive reckless mortgage spree. It was backed by the government's too-big-to-fail policy that guaranteed that, when the banks predictably became insolvent as a result of the loans, government would bail them out. And by government we mean the taxpayer, it was he who picked up the bill for the bank's recklessness. The next step in getting ready for the collapse is an all-out effort to confiscate the wealth of the public. This can be seen in the effort to push investors away from solid forms of wealth protection such as gold and silver, and into stocks, bonds and bank deposits. More recently, we've seen the emergence of an effort to end the use of safe deposit boxes, and a push to end the use of paper currency in making transactions. The end objective is to force as much money as possible into deposits in banks, then take it. The US, EU, and a few other countries have passed confiscation legislation, allowing the bank's carte blanche to confiscate and or refuse to release deposits. Of course a reset of these proportions will not be without its fallout. The public will be horrified at the outcome, at the realization that the very institutions they thought had been created to protect them had never been intended to serve their interests at all. Once they realize that the world's greatest Ponzi scheme has been foisted on them, they will be hopping mad, and justifiably so. Those who had not had the foresight to internationalize themselves, to remove themselves as much as possible from the system, will most certainly want to get even in some way. And this makes clear why governments, particularly that of the US, are working so hard to create a police state. Unless a totalitarian state can be created, those who are presently taking the wealth may not be able to fully realize their objectives. The coming train wreck is no accident. It has long been planned. That the smart fellows in charge will somehow save the day is therefore a vain hope indeed. It's still possible to back out of the system, but it's getting more difficult every day. The window is closing, and the time to internationalize is now. Note. A big part of any strategy to reduce your political risk is to play some of your savings outside the immediate reach of the thieving bureaucrats in your home country. Obtaining an offshore bank account is a convenient way to do just that. That way, your savings cannot be easily confiscated, frozen, or devalued at the drop of a hat or with a couple of taps on the keyboard. In the event capital controls are imposed, an offshore bank account will help ensure that you have access to your money when you need it the most. In short, your savings in an offshore bank will largely be safe from any madness in your home country. Despite what you may hear, offshore banking is completely legal and is not about tax evasion or other illegal activities. It's simply about legally diversifying your political risk by putting your money in sound, well-capitalized institutions where it's treated best. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This Everything Inside Me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.